All right, previously we discussed work, the concept of work, which was force times displacement, and that was a form of energy. In our last video, we talked about kinetic energy, which was the energy of moving objects. So in this one, we're going to look at something called gravitational potential energy of an object. So if you could imagine, or try it yourself, if I hold a book above the desk and keep it from falling, it has zero kinetic energy. If I let go of the book, the book goes from having zero kinetic energy to suddenly having kinetic energy. So today's conversation will be, where did that energy come from? So a bit of an analogy, uh, a bit of an overs oversimplification, but it helps with the understanding. A spring can store both repulsive and attractive potential energy. So if you compress a spring, you have applied a force over a distance, you've done work on the spring, and put energy into the system. This energy is stored in the spring until it's released. So when the energy is released, the stored energy transforms to become kinetic energy. Okay, now the same logic applies if you stretch a spring. So there will be a stored energy that wants to return to its equilibrium location. Gravity acts like a stretched spring near the surface of the Earth. Okay, when objects are raised off the ground, gravity wants to pull them back, which we will call gravitational potential energy. And just so we're clear, this is a very simplistic way of explaining this concept. Your understanding of potential energy will expand greatly with more learning, especially in the grade 12 course. But for now, this will get us through grade 11, and it'll get us to take a few steps forward. So we're going to go with it. Okay, gravitational potential energy, a stored type of energy. So we're going to develop, just like we did with kinetic energy, we're going to develop a little formula for gravitational potential energy. So to do that, we're going to work backwards. But let's start with a conversation here real quickly about... Okay, here's that book I was holding up in the air. It has no velocity, therefore it has no kinetic energy. Now, it has some sort of gravitational potential energy, and we don't know what that is at the moment, and it's some distance h or d. Be very flexible in what letters you use there. It doesn't really matter. It's just some change in height. Okay, we'll use an acceleration due to gravity of 9.8 meters per second squared, and it's going to have some final velocity. Okay, so when it gets down to the ground, or our reference line, that's the bottom of the problem, we would expect the gravitational potential energy to be zero, and we'll talk more about that in future lessons. And we already know that the kinetic energy will be based upon this unknown velocity. So let's start the proof. Okay, so I'm going to hide a little bit of it so it's not too overwhelming. Okay, so we're going to work the problem backwards. So we have our kinetic energy, which is based on the final velocity, so right before the end of the problem. So if we take that VF, that final velocity, and I look at my kinematic equations, and I replace the VF squared with this entire expression right here. Okay, so I'm going to take VF and I'm going to replace it with VI squared plus 2AD. Okay, so you can see that shows up right there. Okay, now I'm going to put VI, or the initial velocity, I'm going to set that to zero, okay, because we're starting from rest. So this is one of those assumptions, like we did in the kinetic energy uh, proof, that there's an assumption in this problem where VI is zero. Okay, so that is why this term right here goes to zero. And now if you're looking at this algebraically, you can probably already see, hey, this is going to clean up kind of nicely. Okay, so the twos, you'll see these will cancel. You'll notice that the A turned into a G, okay, and all that's saying is the A, the acceleration in this problem, is the same as the gravitational acceleration, okay, so instead of using A, we're actually, say, putting G in, okay, and you can use D or H, it doesn't really matter, okay, textbooks have them written different ways, and we come up with this little formula, okay, so the potential energy, EG, Okay, potential gravitational energy is mass times gravity times height. Okay, and if you look really carefully at that, these two together here, you'll notice that's a force. 
Well, in a force times some sort of displacement, okay, that's, a, that's our Newton meters, so we have joules. Okay, so just something to consider. Uh, if you could make a note of this on your formula sheet, this would be really awesome. We're going to do a little bit more of this in section 5.3, but we've talked about our simplistic view of energy for the intro here is going to be all about mechanical energy. Okay, so we're going to have our kinetic energy plus our gravitational poten potential energy is going to make up something called our mechanical energy. And that will be further discussed and utilized, and it's not super complicated, so don't panic. But just to throw that out there, that we're just talking about this mechanical energy idea. We're not going any deeper. Okay, so now reference line has a bit of an importance when it comes to calculating gravitational potential energy. So if we have a 10 kilogram mass and it sits on top of a one meter tall table right beside a five meter, <coughs> five meter deep ditch, what is the gravitational potential energy when the reference line is the tabletop? So if we were to put a reference line, let's use red, right there. Well, that would mean that the D or the H, the D in this case would be zero. So our potential energy if we put the reference line at the tabletop, this object would have zero joules of potential energy. Okay, If I set my reference line on the ground, right here, okay, then that would mean my d, or my height above the reference line, is one meter, which would mean my eg would be mass, which is 10, times gravity, times the height above the ground, and I would have 98 joules. Okay, yet it's the exact same condition. Okay, so nothing's changed, just my reference line. The problem is still the same. Okay, now reference line is the bottom of the ditch. So if I put my reference line down here, my D is now 6 meters, so my EG is going to be 10 times 9.8 times 6, and if we punch that in our calculator relatively quickly, oops, 10 times 9.8 times 6, 588 joules. Okay, so now, again, the problem didn't change. We just changed where we were going to measure with respect to, okay, or where our reference line is. So if you thought of this, uh, the box sitting on top of the table, Think of it like the book we were dropping earlier. If you let it go and it has zero potential energy, that's going to turn into zero kinetic energy. The box is not moving. If you let the box fall off the table, it has more energy now to turn into kinetic energy, so we would expect it to be going some sort of velocity compared to the first case, okay? but not as much as the third case, which is falling all the way down into the ditch. And because this has a larger energy to convert into kinetic energy, we would expect it to be going faster at the bottom of the ditch, which we know from kinematics would be true. All right, so what is the gravitational potential energy of a 48 kilogram student at the top of a 110 meter high drop tower? So you have some sort of drop tower that's 110 meters. You have some sort of chair with a student in it that is 48 kilograms. Okay, so we are asked for a find EG, the gravitational potential energy. So EG equals mass times G times height or D, doesn't matter. So we have 48 times 9.8 times 110. So let's go to our calculator and let it do all the heavy lifting. So we have 51,744 joules of potential energy. Okay, so here's a 58 kilogram person walks down a flight of stairs, use the ground as the reference level. So again, they're telling us where the reference level is. That's really important. Some questions you get to choose it. And if you choose wisely, you can make the problem really easy or you can make it really difficult. Okay, so if you want to pause it and try this, you can go for it right now. Okay, so we're going to calculate the person's gravitational potential energy at the top of the stairs, on the landing, and on the ground level. 
Okay, so it's the same expression. You'll notice it's just a small little uh, three variables multiplied together, m, g, h, or d, it doesn't really matter. Okay, so if we do these uh, 58 times 9.8. Now, if we're at the top of the stairs, this becomes a 6. So we have 58 times 9.8 times 6, and we have 3,410 joules. Okay, if we switch to the landing, then we have the exact same thing only with 3 meters. So we should have half of that, 1,705 joules. And then lastly, when we're on the ground, uh, because we're on the ground, our D equals zero, and we would have zero joules. Cool. So 3,400, 1,700, and zero joules. So what happens to gravitational potential energy as you go down a flight of stairs? Well, your gravitational potential energy decreases. What happens to gravitational potential energy as you climb a flight of stairs? Your gravitational potential energy increases. Okay, so that's a, just a little short lesson because the last one on kinetic energy was so long. Uh, we're going to spend more time talking about power production and hydroelectric dams and things, but one thing you should take away is dams, this is the dam, they store up a very high reservoir of water and that water has a lot of potential energy, okay, because it has a certain amount of height. So we're going to continue that discussion as we move through uh, both electricity and energy, but if you want to watch an interesting video, there's a link in the PDF to the Three Gorges Dam in China. You might find it fascinating and maybe disturbing. Okay, so three questions to try. Okay, so on page, section 5, 2, 1, 2, and 3, and we will roll these into bigger problems in the next section. Thanks for watching.